hello again, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Angles and Attitudes. As always, my partner, John. John, how you doing? Hey, Mark. How's it going? We're going to have a great one tonight here. Hey, uh, that handsome gentleman you see below us, you probably may not recognize his face, but uh, when we start the interview, you will definitely recognize his voice. Um, Sports Chicago radio reporter, sports phone, and now a purveyor of his own podcast, George Offman. George, thanks for joining us, and welcome to Angles and Attitudes. Thank you. It's, it's my pleasure, and I can tell you that it, most people have told me over the course of my 48-year career, I do have a great face for radio. <laughs> it's funny <laughs> you should say that, because many have said the same for extra <laughs> wives, have said the same for John uh, and I, but uh, it's, it's always interesting We've listened to you for so many years on the score and on, on various other platforms to hear that voice. And you're like, oh, yeah, that's the guy in the car when we were driving to work. And, and he would be going back and forth with Terry, uh, you know, with Terry Boers or with Bernstein or with, uh, you know, the heavy fuel crew or those types of guys. So it's really a pleasure. We mean that sincerely to have you joining us today. Well, believe it or not, it has now been 13 years almost to the day, I think it was uh, maybe 10 days earlier than this, that I left the score. So in between, there was 10 years at WBBM, there was 10 months at WGN, which included a nice trip to Philadelphia to watch the Blackhawks hoist the Stanley Cup. So time time flies. It sure does. And, and we had seen, and we won't stay on the score, obviously, but um, the other day, Tom Shear was on, and it's like 30 years since the inception. That's 30 a hard years. One too. Yeah, January 2nd of 1992 is when uh, the score came on the air. And it, I'm always fascinated to look back and see the tremendous success of not those of us in front, but those of us behind the camera or behind the radio uh, and the microphone people that were producers like Jesse Rogers and Judd Surratt and Matt Spiegel, I mean, they have really sprouted into tremendous uh, journalists and broadcasters. And so uh, I always, I, I admire that more than anything else is to see the guys who were younger than us. Cause when, when I started, I was 38, Mike North was 39, Jiggs was in his mid thirties or something. So, you know, we started there when we were already, with the exception of, of Mike, we were already 15, 20 years into a career. George, for the few shows that were on at that time, did you think with some of the names you've mentioned, because at that time, 1992, you know, the 30-some years ago, did you think it was going to take off? Well, I mean, there were doubts, uh, some, but we were all focused on trying to put out a product with people that didn't know other people. I mean, Mike North was kind of the, the X factor because a lot of people didn't know him. He was not part of a media group, although he did do a bartered program for Dan Lee's, uh, one of Dan Lee's stations for a couple of years. It was a gambling program. Imagine that now, 30 plus years later, he's doing the same thing, only he's doing it with WMBP. But the rest of the guys I knew, the problem was that the rating system had us really inaccurately uh, rated. And so there would be this feeling of depression when you saw numbers that were lower than they were expected. Yet, the bottom line is people were talking about us all over town. And because of that, you got the sense that I think we're on the ground floor of something pretty good. And as it turned out, it was more than just good. Well, and to your point, you know, the you found that the passion was so deep and, and to this day, right? You have a bad Bears game and all you got to go through is whether you're listening to OB and Hamp on WGN or just go down the dial. And and I, I ask you, sometimes a, a losing Bears team was way better radio than when they won, right? Oh yeah, no, no. It, 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 you've got all the angry folks that came out when teams were not doing well. Right. If they were doing well, everybody loved it. But, you know, what's the criticism for? It was like, you know, Joe Madden in game seven of the of the, the World Series against the Indians. You know, people were wondering about his strategy and everything else. You know, they're, they're on pins and needles and biting their nails and everything else. So, of course, when the Bears weren't very good. But then remember, at the beginning, we had some incredible analysts. We had Mike Ditka, Doug Collins right off the shoot. You can't get much better than that. And that was a tremendous draw for us. And 
And I thought that all of you brought something to the table, you know, something different that, like you said, everybody around town, if it was in a car radio or you listening to it in the morning or in the afternoon, it was like, okay, what's Hoffman going to say? What's North going to say today? We were looking forward to something. Well, that's, it's nice to know that. And, and it was also nice to finally expand. Remember the station began as a, a daytime station. So you, you started in the winter and you were starting at 7.30 in the morning. You were off at 4.30 in the afternoon. Of course, as the season progressed, by summertime, you're on at uh, 6 o'clock in the morning. You're off at 8.45 until finally we got you know to 11.60 and then 6.70, and it's now 24 hours. But um, yeah, it was, it, was, it was fascinating to be part of that group, I, you know, to, to, to be with people like Dan McNeil and, and Terry Boers. I've said this before, and I'll say it again. I think Terry is the greatest talk show guy in the history of our city. And that's really taking in a lot of very good people who are on the air today, um, because Terry was able to combine integrity uh, and incredible wit. I mean, he was really funny. And anybody who listened to the station realized Terry could get me going to the point where I was in such tears, I couldn't even talk. What Terry did, he was kind of at the start, as you first are introduced to him, a little bit of a, an acquired taste. But over yes. the course of time, you were able to, to gather the sarcasm and the wit and inner working his newspaper background and, and all of those types of communication things. And I think on some level, there's still some really good people in there now. And, but there was a level of, like you said, sophistication or professionalism that not everybody can kid anymore and, and just, you know. I don't know. I don't know. I'm going to disagree with you on that. Okay. I, mean, there, I, I think that the station today has got some really, really very good, talented people. You know, David Haw has made a great transition yeah. uh, in his position. Dan Bernstein has made transitions for himself. You know, when he was with Terry Bores and, and Leila Rahimi, and now he's going to be basically solo to Danny Parkins, who's really a very good talk show host, very bright. He's very quick. He's confrontational, but he's not confrontational to the point where you'd say, man, I can't listen to this guy and match beautifully with Matt Spiegel. And then there's Lawrence Holmes. That's a very good group of people over there. So I wouldn't discount any of them. I think that the the question will roll back a little bit. You were talking about being behind, you know, the scenes or that and the producers and all. You like you said, I could sense the the pride like a coach, right? My my team and and some of these guys that uh, were when they were, you know, in the in the peewees or or bantams to use a hockey term, and now here they are on their own. So there's there's got to be a sense of pride, right? Be able, like you said before, I remember when they were just when Speaks was just doing, you know, a, a little bit of baseball or what, it, you know, uh, Terry Boris used to call him what, meat pants? And and now yeah. meat pants is doing drive time on, uh, you know. Well, not only that, but he's a very accomplished musician as well. So yes. he's, he's a multi-talented guy. It's just, you know, the station has evolved and it's it's 30 years old and it's still going strong, which is, a, and it's nice to know that you were part of the very beginning. Uh, I was hired on my birthday, December 28th, five days before we were on the air. And the other guy who was hired with me was some fellow named Greeny. I don't know, but Mike Greenberg or something. I don't know. Like, yeah, we don't know what yeah. happened to that guy. Yeah, no, no. The only difference between him and me is, you know, how many zeros are in his paycheck. He's got a few more than I do. Yeah, just- Or uh, that right after sports phone that you got hired, right? Was that after sports phone? Sorry, fellas, I didn't hear that. No, I said, George, you got hired right after Sports Phone for that? Right after Sports Phone? Oh, no, no, no. I was only at Sports Phone. I was also in the, in the um, I was at, at the beginning of that as well, just like six weeks after that began in 1977. I joined that on Christmas Eve with Fred Huebner taking me through the ropes. But I was only there for till the summer of 1979. I was thankfully fired. Uh, because I began freelancing and then I had a freelance career that lasted 13 years. I was on my own completely. I did. I love that part of my career. So um, it was 13 years before I started at the score and actually about a month before I was hired, turned down an opportunity to do talk radio in Toronto, which was you know, a wonderful opportunity, but I, I gambled to, 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 uh, to stay in Chicago and hopefully be hired by the score. But, uh, and when you, you mentioned Sportsphone, 
I mean, the alumni of Sports Phone is a basically who's who of Chicago media. Just about everybody worked there. Uh, just about everybody in New York worked for New York Sports Phone. So it was a great stepping stone and the perfect timing for a lot of people who progressed in the broadcast business because it was just really the radio broadcast business was just exploding in the late 70s and the 80s and 90s. That's uh, yeah, like we said, is we we're uh, just north or south of 60. So those starting your full time job and going to work, you're in the car doing a nine to five and you pick up, you find you lock in on that and you're running to your radio every day when you get in your car to find out, you know, what someone was saying or, you know, what what did North say or, you know, what, what was Ditka like that day after after a loss. And as you said, the, the skill set of those people, but that was important, right? Because the Chicago sports fan want doesn't want lied to is a strong word, but right. They want to hear the truth and they, they want to hear it from people with some credibility. So that obviously was very important with, you know, jigs and then Ditka and, and Collins and, and all of those type of guys. Right. Well, there was some credibility already. I think you had Tom share, you had uh, Dan McNeil who had already worked in several years with Chet Kopic. Terry Boers had done, I think, some radio prior to that. So there was some built-in credibility. But then you're, after that, it was, it was an acquired taste. And the guy who really tied it up was a guy that most people never heard of. His name is Mike North. Well, we, we had Mike on. He did, uh, I think, our interview. He did 30-something minutes, and it felt like five because that's all John and I got to ask questions. Yeah, that was Mike. <laughs> That's that's Pappy. Likes yeah, to Pappy talk a lot. Just, it was like go. I was like whoa. I, and then John kind of just winked at me and said, "Stay out of his way." And I said, uh, "Fine." Yeah, it was. A, was it hard to get guests in those days? In those early years, uh, George, was it hard for well, like the pro professional athletes to come to the show? Did they say, "Okay, hey, you know how how did that work in that was, era?" In the beginning, it was it was tougher, I think, for the the regular producers to do that. But I was immediately in the field and covering spring training, you know, six weeks after we're on the air. And I remember approaching and we had those huge uh, block cell phones. This is before the little cell phone. These are big suckers, weighed about five pounds or whatever. And I'm approaching people like Ryan Sandberg and Andre Dawson. And they're saying, I'm not going on that station because they're already listening. They were, if they weren't, they were being told what was being said, and they said, uh, 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 and it was, a, it was tough, but, you know, it was not part of the job that I particularly liked, it was part of the job that you had to do, but as time went on, there were more people that actually enjoyed doing it, because they were, they were athletes who listened. Mm -hmm. And, and I guess that at that point, you, it's, it's not those like some of the stuff you might see or hear today, but you guys were looking for for content and and let people express themselves and and share that and in their own way. Those, some of the you know those players over the course of time have built their brand and like you said, two guys that were very clearly um, not necessarily camera hogs or mic hogs were great players like Dawson and Ryan Sandberg. Right, just let me do my right, job right. And, and go about my business. Right. Well, but then there were some receptive people. You know, I think Frank Thomas for a while was very receptive and then he became the opposite. Um, he was praised, but when he got criticized, Frank, you know, became a wallflower. Uh, and there were some people who didn't want to do it, but some people who really enjoyed it. They really enjoyed the repartee. So um, I didn't do a lot of talk then. I did some fill-in talk. Um, until we did the, the baseball show. I think that started in 2004, 2005. But I think it was, uh, it, it just took time for people to recognize this was the first all sports radio station. And then there's WMVP um, came, I think a couple of years later. So suddenly there was competition, which I think made the score a better radio station. But it was competition, but there was a lot more that ESPN at that time had a lot more of the national programming on. You had that, that greeny guy in. Um, um, well, no, not this in the in the early going. Um, they did local programming. I don't think, you know, that greeny wasn't there until 1996. 
Okay. Um, so in the beginning, that was, I mean, I don't think Greeny did his radio show until, my gosh, in the early 2000s. Okay. So they had a group of local people that constantly changed. You know, they had some people in the field. And so there was some legitimate competition between the two stations. For a local station, it took off like fire. I mean, it was it was a fireball because, like you said, all the different personalities, all the different talk. And then, of course, you had this ESPN that you would watch at night. That's how I looked at it. Listening to the local, watching the ESPN, you know, they kind of clubbed together at the same time. For a lot of sports fans, I imagine that was the case. Um, I know that I was out covering a lot of games. So, you know, I was constantly busy and on the go, whether it was at that stage, Sarasota at the beginning, then Mesa, then suddenly I'm in Pittsburgh for the Stanley Cup finals. And so I was moving around and around and around. And listen, it was a great experience to do all of that traveling. And then I did it again later when the I was on the baseball beat. So this is 2003, and suddenly I'm covering the Cubs down the stretch in Pittsburgh and Cincinnati, and then they make the playoffs, and they win their first playoff series in Atlanta since 1945. Also a very interesting you know, position to be in. And then eventually the White Sox, and traveling, gosh, I don't know, four or five, six different cities and winding up in Houston where they swept the Astros. So it was a wonderful experience for me in that I got to uh, I got to experience championship sports. You know, I got to experience a, a, a White Sox World Series. I didn't get the Cubs World Series while I was there, but I got some pretty good you know playoff games and things like that. So it was always a it was a, always a really good experience to uh, to travel uh, to cover locally uh, to anchor there, and of course that every people will remember to coin the great phrase, a towering line drive. <laughs> <laughs> well said, well said. So, you know, we had um, Wayne Larrabee from the, the Packers was on a couple of weeks ago. And it's interesting, excuse me for interrupting, interesting to note, but I'm finishing an interview. Well, I did an interview with Wayne in, I think it was July for our podcast. I still haven't put it out. Okay. And I'm talking to Wayne tomorrow to kind of freshen things up and then we'll put out his podcast sometime. It'll probably be a year before it comes out. Wow. Just because sometimes those things will happen in the course of combining so many interviews with all of these people that basically most of them will hold because there isn't much change in their careers. But in the case of Larravee, when we did it in July, a lot of changes. Aaron Rodgers, uh, Devontae Adams, the Bears, and all of their changes. And so you do a little freshening up, but it's interesting. I'll be talking to him tomorrow morning. So a lot of those you piece together then, George, to what you're saying. Not a lot of them. There are very few that get that kind of treatment. I did that with Hub Arkish. Mm -hmm. um, I think those would be the only two. Otherwise, uh, some interviews I can turn around in, say, a month. Some of them might last, uh, I'll, I'll give you an example, uh, Kevin Harlan, who I interviewed last April. So it's, tw it's 2020. And I was gonna schedule him in June that year. And I realized, you know, he's not part of the NBA's playoffs after the first round. Why don't we save this interview? It's a two part interview until the Super Bowl, which of course he does for Westwood One Radio. And he was great. I've known Kevin for 40 years. I've known, I knew Kevin, when he first started out of college, hired to do the first ever pre, post, and halftime radio show. This was for the Kansas City Chiefs, and he was still a sophomore or junior in college. And that's how I got to know him back in 1980. Wow. So some of these interviews, uh, you know, man, I think we're running uh, Pat Cassidy next Tuesday. Pat, of course, the longtime anchor at WBBN, WMAQ, did 51 years of morning drive. That interview is done just a month ago. We're turning that around and, and running that next week. He's a uh, he's a wonderful guy. I we we were fortunate enough to interview him like a month or two before he retired, and that was one of the ones we've done. Maybe what close to fifty now, John. That interview yeah. with him surprised me a lot more than most of the other ones because not that his personality doesn't shine through as much 
uh, when he was on, you know, at, at six o'clock in the morning or whatever, but very warm and, you know, um, good storyteller, great sense of humor, just kind of came, he, he came across as just like one of the guys and it doesn't necessarily seem that way when he was on the radio, but um, in, very enjoyable nonetheless. But back to Larrabee, one of the things that he made a point of was his first year with the Bears, they won a Super Bowl. And he looked back on it now and it was like, not that he um, regretted, but wished to have been able to be there a little bit with the climb. And you talked about some of those teams with the White Sox and as the Cubs developed to be able to kind of go, well, they were here and now they're here. And there was much more maybe enjoyment or excitement or appreciation for what happened in that respect. Did you find that with some of the stuff that you did as well? Well, are you talking about the Bears in particular, or no? Or? Just like like the White Sox or, or the Cubs, is that climb? You know, the 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 playoff run that, to get to Atlanta and some of those other things. I mean, well, sure. I mean, but but I've seen the ups and the downs over the course of you know forty four years in this marketplace. To you know, teams that were looked good and they weren't good, and teams that should have been good that weren't. But yes, to see the climbs, I mean, the White Sox in the early going when we started, remember, we started in 1992, the White Sox were a division champion in 1993 under then Tony LaRusse, I believe to this day, and I haven't talked to Tony since I've been off the radio now for nearly two years, but I believe I am the only media person now around that was around when Tony first started with the White Sox back in 1979. And, and it looked like they were going to be a championship team for a number of years. Remember 1994, there was the strike. And I was just discussing that with a, a future guest, uh, Darren Jackson, who, of course, is the longtime radio and TV voice for the Chicago White Sox. So you saw that climb. Um, the Cubs were just kind of like 1994, uh, 1984, I should say, with, of course, that was, now I'm dating myself before the score. Um, their team in 1998, Wonderful team with Sammy Sosa, who was, right. of course, uh, on his performance-enhancing drugs. We don't have to argue about that. I think we know that for, for, fact, for a fact. But they didn't really do anything. And then, and then comes 2003, and the remarkable run with Dusty Baker and the unfortunate disaster that took place both in Miami and at Wrigley Field. Not in Miami. Actually, they came home with a three games to one lead, and, and then they fell and really didn't do kind of much after that until what, 98, or was it? Uh, oh, that's, you were talking about 2007, 2008, or 2008, 2009, when they won, uh, you know, well, with, the the playoffs. with Vanilla, yeah. Yeah, when, when they, you know, made consecutive uh, playoffs and went 0 and 6. So, yeah, I mean, the ups and downs, Atlanta was great. Atlanta was, um, I mean, that, that run that the Cubs had, uh, in in 2003 was the likes of which th that one game game five in Atlanta which was Yom Kippur I was asked do I want to go cover the game I said are you crazy of course I'm going to go to Atlanta for game five it's one of the most memorable games I've ever covered because the game was the it was the largest crowd in the history of the Braves which included Boston Braves Milwaukee Braves, Atlanta Braves. There are 54,000 people in Turner Field and there were far more Cubs fans. I would say there were well over 30,000 Cubs fans. I thought I was at a Cubs home game. I was remarkable. The whole scene in the locker room, watching Kerry Wood spray champagne outside to, uh, over Cubs fans. It was really just an incredible, wonderful experience to see that happen. And then the disaster comes. And two years later, there I am in Houston where the White Sox are vanquishing the Astros in four games. So yeah, it's a lot of fun. It's, it's great to be part of history. It's great to be a, a journalist that's part of that kind of history. And then, you know, four years later, I'm at WGN and um, I'm only there for 10 months. And here's game six in Philadelphia. And they're asking me, uh, George, you know, this is 24 hours ahead of time. George, would you like to cover game six? I said, let me think about it. Yes. <laughs> what are you nuts well i'm part of the broadcast team so as they go to overtime we are sitting in the hallway those of us who are part of broadcast teams because it's, whoever wins we're allowed on the benches within 30 seconds it was the blackhawks and there i am on a bench mind you watching a stanley cup being hoisted right by me it was a very surreal experience it was fabulous to be there
I can't even I can't even imagine. And <clears throat> and that was the beginning of that stretch too for Blackhawk fans, where you know. And, but again, you're talking about the ebbs and the flows, and it, it seems like it was only yesterday, and now the big playoff hole, and here we go again with three to five years worth of rebuild. And yes. Uh, and, it, and yeah. it goes the other way again. That's the one thing, and that's been the biggest problem, I think, with um, other than the Bulls, who had that sensational run. And yes, I was part of that with the score and Michael Jordan. That that was a well, that was a great run that really started with Michael Jordan and got better and better and better as you went along. Otherwise, there really hasn't been consistency with the other franchises. You know, the Bears were a, a good in '84, and they won in '85. And they never won again. They were really good, but they never won again. And, you know, the Cubs consistency really began with the, the Joe Madden era with Theo. And they had five years. Unfortunately, you know, they made the, they made the, it was the National League Championship Series three times. They won one World Series, but that was a disappointment. Look where they are now. They're kind of in a rebuild mode. And the White Sox, for the first time in probably, I don't know when, have a consistently good team. They made the playoffs twice. They should make the playoffs again this year. They're going to be challenged. So in the course of history, there's not been that consistency that some cities have had, like Boston. Hey, you know, when you got the Patriots, but the Bruins have been very consistent. The Red Sox, up and down, but they win World Series. You know, the Celtics, and that doesn't happen in Chicago. You just have to get used to the fact that there's, if there's an up, it doesn't last very long, and then there's a down. George? So tell me a story I don't know. We'll talk <laughs> about your podcast, uh, which is taken off fantastic. People love it. I love it. Mark's been watching it. Tell us a little more now about tell me a story I don't know. Tell me a story I don't know is in its second year. It is a, uh, it's an audio only podcast that involves top storytellers with connections to Chicago. And so we have had a, a flurry of very, very interesting guests from our original guest last January, a year ago, a year plus ago, which was Michael Wilbon, uh, you know, a Chicagoan. And, you know, if you if you follow Michael on Twitter, he's going to have his say about the, was particularly about the Bears and his Cubs. But in the interim, we've had people like Greedy and Steve Stone and Sarah Kustak and et cetera, et cetera. And all of these wonderful people have great stories to tell. And, and in particular, some of them just happen to be great storytellers. People like Dave Wonstadt, Dan Plesak, Dave Refson. Uh, they're just incredibly good storytellers. Yet there's never been a poor interview. Everyone has been fabulous. Uh, tell me a story I don't know can be found on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you get your, your podcasts. They come out every Tuesday. We are currently uh, running Dan Rowan, who, uh, you know, has been at WGN TV now. This is his 38th year. He's going to retire this year. Um, it's kind of we're running this, this sequence of guests that are either retired or will retire. We had a two-part series with Pat Foley. Pat was great. I was here when Pat walked in the door in 1980, and here he is now. He's going to walk out the door. And then we're going to follow Dan Rowan with Pat Cassidy. So... Uh, and, and today, what am I doing before I did this for about four hours, editing an interview with Jeremy Roenick. Uh, there's, there's a guy who's had quite a, quite a history and a very checkered history over the last couple of years. So it's, they're all fascinating people. Um, we have upcoming interviews. I, matter of fact, uh, I don't know, it was like about three weeks ago, I interviewed Ron Rivera, you know, the head coach of the Washington Commanders, who, of course, is a member of the Chicago Bears Super Bowl team. Sure. We're going to be talking to Lisa Byington and Cassidy Hubbard. So there's a lot of interesting people. All these people either worked here or grew up here. And that's the whole part of tell me a story I don't know. But it's all there. It's, it's really, it's about them. And they really shine. And if you say the interview is going to be 40 minutes and you're looking at the clock and these guys have gone past an hour because they can't stop talking. Mike North was one of those guys. Mm -hmm. I mean, my, when I was done with Mike North, it was an hour and 20 minutes. I said, oh, two, two parts, same with David Kaplan. It's like, how am I going to edit these guys? We do it. We, we find a way. Well, yeah. How do you get a word in edgewise on Kaplan? Because <laughs> Kaplan gets going, you're just kind of, you're along for the ride, right? Well, yeah, because he tells long stories, but so did Eddie Olchek. And Eddie is great. That I mean, th they tell extremely long stories, but that's part of it. 
Mm -hmm. You know, I could do that with you guys now, and I just did because when you, it's like a faucet. You open the faucet, you let the water run, and it's just going to keep running and running and running until you turn off the faucet. I don't want to turn off the faucet. The stories are wonderful. Yes, afterwards, you got to figure out, okay, how am I going to fit this all in and do the editing, which I find a way to do. But they're just, you know, they're, they're wonderful because I think when the interview gets going, they realize this is mostly about themselves. Mm -hmm. And when you're talking about yourself, you can talk forever. Steve Stone and Steve, Steve, not only a great interview, he's hilarious. Yeah. And that's another part of this is that you, you get entertainment. Some of these people are very, very entertaining as well. So I, I appreciate interview, every interview that we've done. And I hope that the audience continues to grow. We've done fairly well in that department. Um, and so, you know, sky's the limit with tell me a story I don't know. And uh, we've got a lot of people that have already been interviewed and scheduled for our summer season. And so I'm always ahead. Like I said, sometimes these interviews get shelled and they're not heard for eight, nine, 10 months, but they're there and they, they wind up uh, getting downloaded sometime. It's amazing because I'll tell Mark before an interview, I just got a call, let's say from uh, Chris Myers, uh, Mark, only 30 minutes. All right, John, 30 minutes. And then Mark, the next day or right after the podcast, I thought you said 30 minutes. We went an hour with the guys. So, but again, they have so much to tell. Yes. Well, I mean, that's that's part of it too, but you're leading, you're leading them. And right. once you lead them, um, they'll usually come up and say something like, oh, here's a story I've never told before. And I'm thinking, good. That's exactly yeah. what this is all about. And you're fascinated. I love that, that Dave Revson, who's just a wonderful guy and a great host of the Big Ten Network. I mean, he told an unbelievable story about how he got hooked up in a golfing group with OJ Simpson. It's an incredible story. And he tells it with such verb and you're listening to it. I must have listened to it like 50 times as I'm editing it because it was a great story. And that's just what tell me a story is it's it's fascinating it's part of somebody's life but it's also entertaining as well no and you hear things we interviewed um bill clement and he's been yes. great enough we might be able to we're uh fingers crossed we're gonna uh, talk to doc emrick in in april and and again those you see where that kind of that bubble, like, you know, they talk about the dog's face where he kind of tilts his head and then the light goes on. But you can see that in the guest when they catch that story that they haven't told in a long time or they refreshed it and, and it brings back some memories to them. And there have been some moments where he brought some stuff up, some some dark stuff where some things went bad financially and, he, and, and um, you know, got a divorce and had to pick himself up. And you're like, wow was not expecting that. And then in the next segment, he's telling us about how Steve Durbano butt-ended their trainer at a face-off and they all looked one way at the puck and they looked the other way and the trainer had all of his teeth mm. knocked out by a guy on the ice as he skated by. So you're right. They just go and, and like you said, an hour later, you're like wanting more. Do we have to, you know, we have to stop? Well, when you interviewed Doc Emmerich, who I had on um, last May, um, just talk about the early days when he used to go stand in line to get a ticket at the Chicago Stadium. He 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 was a, grew up in Indiana and he used to come to the old Chicago Stadium back in the seventies. Wow. He is, I mean, as I think, when someone called Marv Albert, who was one of my early guests, actually we had him on when he retired. Uh, the soundtrack of the NBA. Well, certainly Doc Emmerich was the soundtrack of the NHL. And he is a great interview. He's wonderful. He's so enthusiastic. But when you hear his voice, it's just yeah. like, please keep talking because I love to hear the sound of your voice. Well, right? we did that with Wayne Larravee because yeah. that, that voice comes on and you're just waiting and then boom, you're like, there it is. I recognize that. It's It's comforting. Because I know there, that's Sunday afternoons. Yeah, there is. There's the the when you're listening to these people who you've listened to for years. You know, sure. Same with Bob Costas, who again, luckily, I've known him for 40 years. Bob, with the light goes on, and he is just since I told some spectacular stories about Dallas Green um, and and the the, the Sandberg game. But it is that voice and you're listening to it and you are just mesmerized. Yes. 
you know, because you are talking to them, but they're telling you stories. And that's the best part of Tell Me a Story. I don't know. By the way, as for Marv Albert, we'll have a son on, you know, a couple of, like, probably in May, Kenny Albert, who I interviewed, I think, late last year. So we'll have, I think it'll be the first time we have a father and son. Wow. So George has thrown down on us. We got to figure that one out to, uh, we yeah. got, well, we're going to go with father and daughter-in-law. We're going to, uh, Gino Cavallini, who coaches uh, at the mission and played for the Blues, his daughter-in-law was the starting goalie for the women's uh, U.S. team in the gold medal game. As a matter of fact, he owes us an extended interview because he goes, guys, I got to get home. We got a watch party. So the United we'll Olympics, yeah. part two with Gino, and we got to get his daughter-in-law on there. Right, so. There you go. That that'll that'll work. That, that's we'll, that's a good we'll idea. That. And, and yeah, I mean, just we were, you know, nervous, if you will. But once you get people, like you said, talking about themselves, and and sports people are just genuine and and really want to share yeah. and and can tell how dialed in you are and how important in a lot of those situations, right? Those stories that they will share also were somehow connected to you if it's you know if it's you know Sandberger we talked talked to Mark G and Greco and, and silly stuff about like the New Year's Eve things with Janet Davies but those were all the things that we remember and, and he shared or and I don't know and, and I guess I want you to if, we'll put you on a spot can you tell us a story about Chet Kopic because there's always good stories about Chet. Yeah. Well uh, Chet was really um, he was very generous to a lot of us as we were beginning our careers. Um, and he reached out. I think for him, the idea was, if you got a little talent, let me see if I can weave you in. So when Cheryl Ray, Cheryl Ray Stout now, uh, was his producer back in the 80s and he was doing the uh, Copic on sports, I would be on his show as I was covering Blackhawk games. Um, and it was, it was nice. I was, you know, doing uh, my freelancing and Chet was one of my clients. And so he was engaging in the fact that he wanted to have as much local radio people as he could have on. And a lot of people, uh, I've talked to them, uh, owe their careers to him. Kenny McReynolds really owes his career to him. He's, Kenny was another one of my guests and, and, and said how Copic really helped him. You know, Dan McNeil, Dan was his producer and realized that as he was growing, you know, it's time for me to shed Chet. Let me see if I can find something, which, of course, was the store. So um, tell me something dangerous. Tell me something dangerous. Yeah, right. 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 I mean, you know, the, the one thing about Chet, though, is he was, he was always scripted. I mean, his whole show was scripted. I don't know if people realize that, but he you know, every one of his questions was right there, you know, prepared for himself, but it's fine. He was able to do a good job of, you know, uh, interpreting everything that he wanted to say. He had a very interesting style. Um, he was a man who liked to wear fur coats. I think we all said he had a very big ego, yeah. but, and then it was sad uh, to see how Chet left us just as it was not that long ago when we lost Les Grobstein, who was yeah. going to be a guest on our podcast. He agreed to do it, and then, and then we lost Les. So uh, another incredible character over the course of time, a guy who I sat in a press box next to, whether it was the White Sox or the Cubs or the Blackhawks or the Bulls, for over 20 years. Believe me, I got a lot of Les. <laughs> George and Mark, I got to tell you, George, uh, Mark and I have found out like sometimes we have a guest and sometimes we're like, well, I wonder how this is going to go. Does this happen with you where you're going to interview this guest and without mentioning any names and all of a sudden this guest that you thought maybe wasn't going to be the style you thought winds up, winds up being an unbelievable interview. Have you had that? Um, I'm trying to think of anybody I think I've had a few interviews where I thought the interview was going to be really good and it turned out to be average. I'm not going to mention okay. those names, but I did an interview with, um, oh, I, I, I feel terrible now. The, the, the umpire, oh, awful, local umpire here is major league umpire. And I, forgive me for, for not remembering his name, but you know what? At age 68, I don't remember what happened, you know, Come on. at dinner. And, you know, and he was a wonderful interview. And the more I listened to it, 
and uh, the better it was. And so he turned out to be a better interview than I thought. Not I'm trying to think if anybody turned out to be better. Uh, when you're done with it, you usually think to yourself, wow, that was really good. So maybe more often than not, you have high expectations and then they're raised afterwards. Ron Coomer, Ron Coomer was wonderful. Wow. Not only the stories he told, but the heart that he put into those stories was just great. You know, you could feel that emotion that was coming from him. So I, I think that all those interviews, when I'm done with them, I, I usually say the same thing. I said, man, that was a great interview. And I'm not kidding. You know, right. it's like, so, so you think the interview should be really good. And it turns out to be most, almost all of them better than you thought. We can appreciate that. And, and obviously not with the professionalism that you do, but we will uh, immediately after a, a, an interview, we'll call each other and go, that was way better than we thought. You know, well, the, the, you, had, you had Gian Greco. I mean, but Mark um, was one of those that I interviewed before we actually mm -hmm. dropped the first podcast, which was January 26th of... 2021, which I believe was the 35th anniversary of the Bears winning the Super Bowl. But a number of those interviews, of course, had to be prepared ahead of time. Will Bond was, Marv Albert was, Gian Greco was. Well, we wanted to drop Gian Greco right after he was fired, but we had to wait. And Mark asked us to wait because there were some legal issues. Sure. And I've known Mark and I'm a friend of Mark and he's just great. What, what you see is what you get. Yes. There's no fit. He's the same person on the air as he is off the air, which is really great. He's a wise ass from hell, but he's yes. funny as hell. And so finally, we were able to get the permission to do it. And to this day, he is still the guy who drew the most listens that we've ever had. Wow. And yes, we talked about Janet Davies. And yes, we talked about everything. Mark is great. Yes, First he of all, he's, he's, an, he's, been an edgy guy for all of his career. And unfortunately that edginess cost him his job, which it shouldn't have. Um, very creative, came in this market in 1982. And he was, remember he was second behind Chet Kopic and then Chet got fired. And so here's Mark who grew into this. I mean, how many guys can do this for 39 years? He did it for 39 years. Um, Dan Rohn did it for 34. You're never gonna see that again. J Jim Rose, I think he's been on the air for 40 years. That's, that's, those, those days are gone now. You know, we're not going to see that again. But the good part about that is I've been part of that with them. Mm -hmm. I've had the opportunity to interview them for the podcast. And it's a real pleasure for me. Oh, no doubt. I mean, Mark's the guy that you're just like sitting around chatting. I got, John said, give me your, you know, here's his phone number, call him, see what dates are available. And we talked for 20 minutes on the phone eight, and that was the first time I had talked to him. Like we were old buddies and both John and I are, are hockey coaches and our kids played hockey. And we started talking about which oh, rink yeah. we were at, which right. team, crazy hockey moms, the whole bit. And it was, and it just rolled. And he was so nice. We had um, Diane Burns on a couple of weeks later and he jumped on and surprised her. We just called, <laughs> us, can, you, can you jump on? And he came on and, you know, did a shtick there too. But, you know, again, he's that, it was just so, remember he told a story about coming from Buffalo and people not knowing his name. And they're like, what are you, some sort of Puerto Rican or something? Because Gene Greco <laughs> was, he was. And it's just, that was just, that's just him. And it, it really yeah. is. And like you said, it's not, it, it, Obviously, people can read it as offense, but it's genuine. That's who he is. He's not making anything up or trying to do stuff. That's just who he is. Yeah. And it's, that's that's what was really neat about being able to interview him as well. Yeah, well, that's what made him successful. And I I, I bother Mark now and then. You know, he he really needs to continue in some capacity. Uh, and I know he's tired of television, but he still has a lot to offer. And I hope I I hope he finds that conduit. Mm -hmm. to still be part of the media consciousness because we we need him you know what i mean it's oh no doubt we need we need we need more mark giangrecos 100 we got to get the t-shirts going uh uh john <laughs> yeah. no, yes for sure his his time with um with like um waddle and sylvie where he would jump in on tuesday afternoon those neither one of those guys like you said terry makes you cry those two guys were just blubbering and it's just laughing for a half hour and he would just keep 
rapid fire keep coming and it would that was great radio well that's you know he's he's irreverent and it works um it it, it works you know he he should be he should be doing five days of radio but you know what mark can do whatever he wants he's earned it that's for gosh darn sure he said he just wanted to be a grandpa for a while the last time we talked to him. Yeah. Said, how do you argue with that so how do you argue with that all right so we've talked about all of these stories podcasts and how long it takes and we're at a point now where we're going to bring this one to a close because we went way farther than we thought we would too. The tradition we have here is John's the goalie. So we end our, our last question comes from the blue paint. So John is the goalie. He gets the honor of uh, closing the show and having the final question for George. Hey, George is kind of a twofold thing, but I got to ask you because just love hearing all the stories the time that we've been out with you, but, I mean, here's my first one, and then I'll give you the second one. The first one is, I'm only going to give you three. Give me your top three moments where maybe a week or a day doesn't go by that you've covered here in Chicago that you say, wow, like you mentioned the Stanley Cup thing, but what are your top three moments that you covered? And then I'll give you my second half of that. Uh, I think I mentioned one of them, which was the Cubs in Atlanta. Um, I was there covering Pete Rose as he tied the hit record at Wrigley Field. It's a great story behind it because, so this was a Saturday, and Rose was not going to play because as a left-handed hitter, and at that stage, um, he would rather bet, um, let's see, now let me, let me get the, the story straight. So uh, Steve Trout was pitching, okay? And he's a switch hitter, he decided, he just wasn't going to play that day against the little left-hander Trout. I'm just trying to remember the exact part of that. Well, Steve Trout, before the game, was on an exercise bike, and he fell. Fell off an exercise bike. Couldn't pitch that day, and so Rose put himself in the lineup. And what I remember about the day was it was an ominous day. It got windy. It got dark at Wrigley Field. I don't think it rained. And here's – it's like a movie – and Rose tied Ty Cobb's record. And, you know, he still played. Uh, it wasn't like he took himself out of the lineup. He still played in that game, but he did not play in the Sunday game. And, of course, he broke the record the next day. That was really incredible to be at that particular event. Uh, so now I have to pick a third, third one. Yeah. A third one. Um and it's not this podcast, so you got to take that up. No, and it's it, it, that's going to be number four, by the way. So you're, <laughs> sorry you didn't make the top three, guys. It just didn't work out that way. Um, I mean, I, for an event to be there, well, I, I will tell you that one of these, that I'm going to put them together as two. One of them I covered, one of them I was a fan, and I know this. I, I think I could be pretty safe is that I'm the only person on the face of the earth to have seen these two games, the highest scoring game in NHL history, and the highest scoring game in NBA history, the highest scoring game in NBA history was in Denver in 1983. My college roommate was a news reporter there. I went there, I visited him. We went cross country skiing. He said, look, I got two tickets to the game tonight against the Nuggets. I don't want to go to a game. I, I, I see enough games. He dragged, he dragged me to the game. And that was the game in which the, I think it was the, the Pistons beat the Nuggets 186, 184 in triple overtime. Think about those numbers, 186 to 184. Two years later, I'm covering the Blackhawks losing to Edmonton 12 to nine. Highest scoring game in NHL history, highest scoring game in NBA history. And my biggest problem is I had the score sheet and the ticket to the, the game. I can't find it. Oh, I've got oh. everything. Because I'm sitting there saying, eBay, guess what I have? Well, I can't, I can't find it. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make those as a my, my combination of number three. Uh, and last thing for you, besides me and Mark, who are the top two people you hope to interview in the future? And tell me a story I don't know. Uh, well, I'm, there are people. Dude, you I, only got two that you're hoping for. Well, hoping for, I can't. Uh, one of them I'm not going to get that I hoped for, which is Brent Musburger. Uh, the family just didn't want him to do this. And at age 82, I finally got the, the understanding that he wouldn't. Um, I've tried. I've not succeeded yet. One of them is Jason Benetti. 
who I would really like to to interview. Um, and the other and the other one who I'm really working hard to get and want to is Porter Moser. So these are people I want to interview and I hope to interview. Um, but the ones that I, unfortunately, and, and listen, you have a list and sometimes people yeah. won't do it. Greg Gumbel wouldn't do it. He just he was very open. He said, right. I really don't want to do these things. And, um, and, and the same thing with Brent Musburg. I'll do a real quick one with you. Marv Albert wasn't going to do my podcast. And I, I've known Marv since 1979. I did stats for him while he was with the Knicks. I did stats when he was with NBC. And he said, you know, George, unfortunately, I just don't do podcasts. And I was crestfallen that he wouldn't do it. A few days later, maybe a week, calls me back. He says, you know, George, I just got lassoed into doing a podcast with Mike Greenberg and Bob Costas. And since I did one with them, I'm going to do one with you. And he did. Uh, uh, George, I'm going to tell you, and this is how I close it. Thank you for doing one with us because it was a thrill tonight for me and Mark. I, when you said yes to me a couple of weeks back, uh, of course, I always run to my buddy Mark and I told him, you're not going to believe who's going to be on George <laughs> And uh, I really thank you, George. Mark and I truly thank you tonight. My pleasure, fellas. Thanks for having me. All uh, right. Thanks. Stay well.